now. All right, everybody, welcome back to our 101 class. Uh, today, we've got a special guest. We've got Professor Dan Ames. He's representing the Water Engineering Group here at BYU. And uh, Dr. Ames has been here uh, about as long as I have. I think you joined the faculty uh, about the same time I did, maybe just a couple of months later, but, but he was already a professor at another university. So he jumped ship and came and joined. And so uh, he can introduce himself, but uh, you know, without further ado, uh, Dr. Ames, I'll just turn the time over to you. Okay, great, thank you. I hope you can hear me okay, everybody. It's nice to see all of your bright shining faces here on, wow, six pages of people on Zoom. Uh, looks like many of you are just a name without a face. It sounds like a song from the 80s, actually. So, um, but anyway, I hope you can hear the sound of my voice. If you can, if you can uh, hear me wave. Kevin's nicer than me. He doesn't require you all to show video. When you take my classes <laughs> through Zoom, I require you all to turn on your video so I can see and make sure you're not just asleep or something. I think you're that's, I got to, that's to protect the anonymous nose pickers out there. And so we have to yeah, be careful yeah. and, and conscientious of those. Oh, man. Okay. Well, um, anyways, yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to y'all. And what I appreciate more is the fact that I can start seeing some of your names so that when you come into my classes, I will have a better chance of remembering them. I'm looking for any unique or interesting names here. Looks like you got it. You got all the standard ones, Kevin. Um, there's okay. Nick without a K. That's kind of unique. Just the NIC, that's kind of fun. Cecily, I knew a Cecily, but um, okay, we got a, I see everybody's here, well good. I, what happened to all the Daves? What happened to the years when you had like Mary and Martha and Dave and John? Do we have any Johns? One of the things I've learned with, after you've had this job long enough, you get to see the, the trends of what, how parents name their kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a period where we had lots of Davids and Daves, but I don't see Daves. that very often. No Daves. No, oh, I see a Mary. That's good. And um, Haley and okay. Well, hi everybody. So yes, yeah, is Kevin uh, Frankie, your professor said. My name is Dr. Ames. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering. I am just down today. This is casual Tuesday. I didn't come into campus, so I decided to to dress down and keep it easy. And I've got my Diet Mountain Dew here. I'm sitting in my home office. And, um, and a bag of M&Ms, and just really having a nice time. And I've been looking forward to talking to y'all since I got invited, sheesh, I don't know, a couple months ago. I wanna to talk to you today about sort of what is water resources engineering, keeping in mind that what I'm gonna be telling you or sharing with you is like my view, my world view of water resources engineering. Um, it's a huge field. It's a huge field. It's kind of like you're probably already discovering that civil is a huge field. And people say, oh, you're, uh, you're in civil engineering. Um, what is that? And you're like, oh, man, where do I start? Because there's so much to it. And it's kind of like I feel that way about uh, water resources engineering. There's just a lot. So let me see if I can share my screen. I'll share with you a couple of slides and talk a little bit about this. What is water resources engineering? All right. Okay, is that showing up as the presentation mode? Yep. Awesome, thank you. And by the way, Heather, it's good to see you. Again, Heather's in one of my other classes. So yeah, I suggest, hi Heather. <laughs> I suggest you all, she is a quality human being right there. Like if they wanted to select somebody to represent the Society of Women of Civil Engineering, Heather's your girl right there, because she is hardworking quality person. I recommend you all go join. And did you say you're providing free food too? It's on no? Zoom. So normally there will be free food when it's back to real life. That's what you think about the, all this Zoom. BYU is, and uh, Dr. Frank, you could probably attest, BYU gives away more free food to students at student society meetings and meetings and events than uh, anywhere I've ever been. So you got That's right. Them. They don't call it the freshman 15 for nothing. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, that goes for faculty too, we can pick that up. So water resource engineering is kind of cool because uh, water pervades everything in civil. In fact, um, you know, you, you, if you want to get into transportation, you're going to deal with culverts and how water's, water runs off the top of roadways and also how it runs underneath roadways. If you're going to get into geotechnical, you're going to have some interaction with water engineering because geotechnical is here and water resources is here in between is groundwater and the way the, the saturated zone and the, the, all of the water at the water table affects what happens with geotechnical engineering. If you build a foundation for whether for, it's for a road or a building or anything, you're going to deal with water. Uh, construction engineers deal with water all the time. Not only sort of natural water systems, but also engineered water systems such as uh, water supply and wastewater treatment and water treatment. And so uh, really water resource engineering has its little fingers in all of the fields of civil. And that's okay. Uh, because what that means is any one of you, you know, will benefit from taking a water class or two, or even if you decide to emphasize in water, um, you'll find that you'll use it in your career wherever you go. My brother, my big brother at Utah State University was a year ahead of me in the program. He got his master's degree in water resources engineering and ended up going to work for UDOT as a transportation planning um, engineer and does project planning, project management, and all kinds of uh, UDOT type things. But he he said that at the end of the day, it worked out great for him because transportation is very, traffic and water behave very similarly in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of it's about flow and control. And then of course, just the, the knowledge of the water help. So um, I always have to give this little speech that you, you guys that are literally at the beginning of your program, I don't want you to pigeonhole yourself as, well, I'm only gonna do structures. I shall design steel beams until the day I die. Or, oh, I'm only gonna be a traffic engineer and I'm gonna, come up with the craziest, wackiest traffic patterns anybody can think of. And I'm gonna put test drive them all right here in, uh, in Provo and Orem. Don't like put that in your head right now because there's so, such a civil engineering is so broad. There's so many cool things you can do, including um, water. And I would actually recommend people sort of be as broad and diverse as possible. And uh, as, you, as you carry on with your program. So um, water. Water and environmental faculty at BYU were sort of loose, a loose cohort of people that are involved in water. And there's myself up there. I'm a sort of water resource engineering and geospatial technology. So I teach classes on uh, GIS and surveying and geomatics, as well as do water based things and modeling. Dr. Nelson does a lot of modeling and simulation and forecasting. He's been in the news lately because he's been developing models that simulate water flow every single river around the world in real time. It's really ridiculous what he's been able to accomplish and get a lot of good publicity for. Dr. Hotchkiss, he's really interested in a local scale of water and particularly what's happening with sediment and rivers, how sediment builds up in lakes and rivers and how it moves through lakes and rivers. And he, um, now keep in mind, by the way, some of you might be going, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do I care what these professors are quote unquote interested in? Just give me my dang degree and let me get out and get my job. Well, point here is, is that all of us teach classes across the spectrum of water and environment and GIS and, and modeling and things. But we also hire students as undergraduates to work in our research labs. So when I say we're interested in such and so, really what I'm saying is, hey, we've got some cool, interesting research projects going on in these areas. And if you want to do undergraduate research, get paid while you're going to BYU, rather than uh, flipping burgers over at, you know, wherever, then try to get involved in one of the research groups and research labs. So Dr. Hotchkiss, he's hired students, undergraduate students to study sediment and think about, um, he also does this really cool work where he looks at how uh, little low head dams, water flows over the top of them. And when I say low head, meaning it's like a short dam, maybe a meter or two high and water's just flowing over it and how people die in those. Um, and if you can re-engineer those, how you can keep people from dying. So that's some of the research he does. Then Dr. Borup, uh, he's one of our environmental engineers. He teaches classes on water quality and, and like wastewater treatment. If you're going to get into construction, you're going to have to deal with water supply and water uh, wastewater treatment. And so he teaches classes on water quality modeling and or not um, water quality treatment for water for drinking water and also for wastewater. Dr. Williams is a professor also on a little bit more on the environmental side. He has a lot of experience with the army and actually some kind of top secret military stuff. 
but he also does cool work where he looks at reservoirs and lakes from satellites in space and tries to determine the quality of the water from space. It's really ridiculous how we can do that. I mean, we're basically looking at reflectance and different patterns in the signal of reflectance going back to the satellite. You can sort of tease apart, is this got a, does this water have an algal bloom or what kind, of, um, what kind of water quality problems are going on in that lake? And part of his work is fun too because he takes students out in boats to go paddle around lakes and to check the water quality and then compare it to what they're getting from satellites. And then finally, Dr. Miller, he also, he's been around here a little bit of a while, as you can see, he got his PhD in 1975, but Dr. Miller teaches um, a bunch of our hydrology and hydraulics classes, and his research area is quite interesting too. He likes to go up to Yellowstone National Park and study the water quality in all the lakes up there, and for years has sent students up there to do that and analyzes it. So that's the basic group of faculty. We also have Dr. Uh, I actually need to include on here Dr. Jones, Norm Jones. He sort of has his foot in this. Um, he's more of a geotechnical engineer, but because he does groundwater, he's also related to us. So he's our department chair and does studies groundwater. For the record, uh, for the record, he has he has quoted and said in public that he's part of the water group. So mm -hmm. just saying. True. That that would be our chair, Dr. Jones. Got into the slide. Take in class is now called 214 Geomatics. It's required for everyone. It's usually taught by somebody in our group. Um, we do spatial data stuff, and and just like uh, Dr. Frankie covers a lot of these one-on-one classes. I usually cover the geomatics, 214. So if you're, some of you may be in my geomatics class. If you're in my geomatics class, say something in the chat so that I can say hi to you. Uh, geomatics is pretty fun. We start the semester with surveying and then we get into um, using GPS to collect data. And we look at satellite and a little bit of imagery stuff. And then we download a lot of data from the web and we put it in software to make maps and learn how to build maps and how to analyze a little bit of spatial data. That's a fun class. And if you haven't taken it yet, you can take it next semester. 201 is sustainable infrastructure. We also teach out of our group, the hydraulics, 414 class. If you're interested in maps, map making, spatial data, and modeling and all that kind of stuff, or if you want to end up working in one of the research labs, like the hydroinformatics lab, the transportation lab, or even doc Dr. Frankie, um, Dr. Frank's lab, Dr. Schultz's lab, all have benefited from having students that took 414 sooner than later. So that's one you could take um, sort of in your junior year. You could even take it in your sophomore year if you have room for it. Don't hold it out till the senior year because this also gets you internships. If you take 414 early, then you can go get internships outside of campus at engineering companies and tell them that you know GIS and they'll, they'll just be thrilled. Hydrology, hydraulics, uh, 439, I'm gonna show you some pictures of our water resources study abroad program. And then there's some environmental engineering and a, an advanced GIS programming class, and hydroinformatics and some other fun stuff, geoenvironmental engineering. So these are the types of classes that come out of the water group. But you may ask, Dr. Ames, what is water resources engineering? Well, I'm about to answer that for you. Water resources management, and engineering is about solving problems to secure water for people. And so we're basically, in a nutshell, we're looking for the right amount of water and the quality of water to sustain life and the environment. And so quantity of water, we could have issues related to drought, we could have issues related to flooding. Quality of water, you can have clean water and very contaminated water and everything in between. And there are issues in protecting the water so it stays clean. And there's also issues in cleaning water using treatment methods. So um, overall, it's all about water. In fact, I, uh, I sat on an airplane a few years ago. I was flying back, I think from Washington DC back to the back to Utah, uh, back when we used to have airplanes and we go on flights to travel to places. I'm using air quotes because I haven't traveled anywhere in months. Uh, and I sat down next to this lady and she said, and she said, 
like very first thing, hey, well, uh, nice to meet you. Da, da, da. And the first thing she asked me was, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a professor. And then I was like trying to fall asleep again. And she's like, oh, well, what do you teach? And I should have learned my lesson. You're supposed to say math. I know it's lying, but you can cross your fingers when you do it and then it's allowed. But I was gonna, you're supposed to say math because everybody understands math. They've all taken a class in college on math. So if you say I teach math, then they go, oh. And then they didn't like it. So they never ask you more questions about it. And then you go back to sleep. But instead I forgot to say math. And instead I said, oh, civil engineering and focus on water. Civil engineering, she said, civil engineering? You know, I've heard of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. I haven't really heard of civil. But I guess that's one of those ones that doesn't really affect people on a daily basis too much. And I'm like, hmm? Suddenly I'm awake. I have something to say. I'm like, well, actually, as I rotate in my chair toward her, I said, actually, if I could be impertinent and ask you, did you take a shower this morning? Oh, well, yes. And he said, I suppose you also flushed a toilet today? Yes. Okay. You can thank a civil engineer and water resources engineering for making it possible you to take a shower and flush your toilet. Oh. And then I went on about how she got to the airport on roads that were designed by transportation engineers and foundations designed by geotechnical engineers and on and on and on. And I think by the time we were done, she would wish she hadn't asked me. But you're all welcome to use that, those talking points. Water resources engineering started sheesh, 4,000 years BC or more. Um, that's the first known engineering project where the Nile was dammed to improve agricultural productivity in this in these barren land. So I'm sure people were damming little streams and stuff before then, but to dam the Nile River was kind of a big deal. And then there was, uh, there's flooding in the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian towns, the aqueducts built by the Greeks and the Romans. Um, China was building irrigation and flood control works. The Sinhalese in uh, Sri Lanka were using hydrology to build really complex irrigation works. Um, they invented this thing called a valve pit, which allows you to put, um, large, allows you to make big reservoirs and canals. So they actually are still using that, it's kind of crazy. So the history of water resources engineering goes way back to the early days. In fact, there are these things in Egypt that are still there called the nilometers. And they, uh, they actually indicate the height of the flooding of the River Nile. And they had these cool marks on there indicating like if the flood came to this level, then we're going to have a drought. If it came to this level, then we're not going to have crops because everything will be flooded. You know, it's going to destroy the villages. And so there was like this optimal level of flooding. And people would watch those nilometers back in ancient, ancient Egyptian times to see uh, what the flooding was going to be like what the crops were going to be like, whether they were going to have abundant security and happiness or disaster or suffering and hunger, all of which are bad. And guess what? We're still to this day trying to find that balance of water where we have abundance and security and happiness of water where we're in that middle, optimally right in the middle of water security, maybe a little abundance would be okay without having any disasters or suffering or hunger. So this concept of water security sticks around today. Did you know that the 97.5% of all water is salt water? Whoa. And most of it's in the ocean, a little bit in groundwater and lakes, like in the Great Salt Lake. Two and a half percent of all water is fresh water that we can actually drink. And that's most of it's like packed up in glaciers and snow and permafrost with some in big chunk in groundwater. The amount that's actually in lakes where we can use it, or rivers and surface water, is actually quite small, less than 1%. Kind of cool. Look at the rivers, 0.006%. So that's where the water all sits around the world right now. Here's a picture of the water cycle. Hopefully you all saw a picture like this in the fourth grade, and maybe it was a little simpler version of it, but the same idea that um, they taught you then holds true now, which is nice. Some things are pretty consistent. Snow falls out of clouds and rain falls out of clouds. And then it runs down through the landscape in the forms of these little streams and rivers through surface runoff. Some of the water infiltrates into the soil. Some of it percolates back up out of the soil. Some of the water just makes the soil wet and you have soil moisture and you have dry soil. Uh, as the water 
I see a hand, so let me finish this one sentence and I'll call on you, Brooklyn. Um, as that water makes it down low into the soil, it starts filling up the water table that you're familiar with. Some of that leaks back out into rivers and goes into oceans, you have evaporation. It's the whole cycle that you are familiar with from Mrs. Smith, your fourth grade teacher. Um, Brooklyn, so I saw Zoom said a hand was raised and it looks like it was you. Do you have, do you have a question? I see a hand from a Robert Smith. Okay. Uh, if you have a question, type it in the chat and I'll just have uh, Dr. Frankie watch the chat for any questions or comments. I'm just going to talk otherwise because I got, you know, like nice interesting things to show you here. Kevin, you can just interrupt me if somebody has a question or a comment. You got it. Thank you, brother. Here's another picture of the water cycle. So many pictures of the water cycle. Depends on how you slice it and dice it. I mean, you could write a whole PhD dissertation on slicing and dicing the water cycle up into various little components and figuring out what percentage of it is contained where and how it's moving through the landscape and so forth. So this is a lot of sort of large scale water resource engineering is looking at the big picture of the water cycle, looking at flooding and storms and hurricanes, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And then you get down to sort of local small scale stuff like, are we gonna have enough water to put in this apartment building? Floods are the first cause of fatalities and economic loss among all natural disasters in the world. Wow. So overall losses is in green and look at all those losses, natural catastrophe losses. Um, on the left side, natural catastrophes worldwide. You have geophysical events, that's like earthquakes and stuff. Meteorological events, that's storms. And then, so light green and then blue is flooding. And orange is climate, like frost and so forth. But see, I think the storm one, that's actually kind of water also. So these two to go together, the big, the middle block here is all related to storms and water. That's why the work that Dr. Nelson is doing on being able to predict floods and flooding and stream flow around the world is really important. $200 billion in just four years in flood damage. I'd like to see what that is now, but 1991 and 1995 is crazy. 2004 was Hurricane Katrina and a massive amount of flooding. And so I, I don't have an updated number, but the, the billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of flood loss. The flip side of this is drought. Here's a place that in the 1940s was lush and in the 1980s wasn't lush because of drought. So that's an issue. In Europe, drought, 1973, drought, 1976, Northern Europe, 16 month duration, massive subsidence claims. That's like welfare. Um, French milk yields were down by 25%. Now that might not seem a big deal to you, but what are the French famous for? Cheese. And so you lose one fourth of your milk, then you lose a fourth of your cheese. Drought. Water availability is decreasing. As water availability decreases, we're gonna have water scarcity. Here in 2025, there's a projected map of the scarcity of water. Now this is gonna be interesting to see because this was projected back in the year 2000. We're only five years away from 2025 right now. It'd be interesting to see how much scarcity there really is in these places, but physical water scarcity will always be in the Middle East and in Northern China. Economic water scarcity, economic water scarcity means there's water there, but it's just being mismanaged. They can't really um, economically get it to the people that need it. What happens when you have all of this scarcity? Well, you have a lot of water scarcity. It means that like, this little girl right here has to walk far with a thing and a bucket and a, and a wheelbarrow thing to go pick up water. And by the way, Society of Civil Engineering Women, this is something that affects women disproportionately than men throughout the world because in these underdeveloped and developing countries, it's, it's been multiple studies have shown that it's always the women in the villages that are the ones that are walking the mile or the two miles with a, uh, with some kind of device like this to go get water. So it's sort of a, it is disproportionately affecting them and it's, um, gender, it's a real gender inequality issue when you have water scarcity, which is a shame, makes it even worse. In the high income countries like the United States, we use over up to 600 liters per person per day. You're thinking, wait a second, I can barely get my 32 ounces a day. My 64 ounces of water a day, I'm supposed to get for, uh, 
for health purposes. Well, yeah, but this is taking into account, you're flushing the toilet, you're taking a long shower, you're sitting in a hot tub, you're using things that are created with water, so you are consuming up to that much water, 600 liters, whether you know it or not. Low-income countries use between 50 and 100 liters per day. If you don't believe that, then just take yourself on a mental camping trip. And in a trailer, like by the summer, I took my little uh, camper up in the mountains out here outside of Lehigh, and we camped for a few days. And I had everybody rationing the water from the little water pump because it has water inside the trailer. And I'm like, yeah, make sure you turn the water off when you're not, you know, wash your hands and then turn it back on to rinse and turn it off again. You can get by with 50 to 100 liters if you're rationing like they do in low-income countries. In very water-scarce countries, they're getting by on 10 to 40 liters per person per day. So uh, the difference is, is largely engineering work to pump, to make the water fresh water and then to pump it and pipe it in. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty for using 600 liters per person per day. That's not my intention. I don't like it when people try to make you feel guilty for using a lot of water. Use water, it's great. I think I'm a believer in metering. I hate paying my water bill, but I believe in metering. I think that cities should meter the amount of water that people are using. And if people wanna use more water, fine, charge them for it. And it's like, if the guy wants to sit out there and wash his car, and leave the hose running for five hours, you know, while he does it. It doesn't bug me as long as he's willing to pay the water bill. So that's why I say you shouldn't feel guilty about using a bunch of water. Pay your water bill, appreciate it, have a little bit in stocked up in storage in the basement in case there's a, a drought someday. And at the same time, do what you can as an engineer to try to improve water usage for everybody else around the world, like people in low income and water scarce countries. Um, get involved in whatever way you can, clever ways to develop new water treatment systems, to make sure the countries are growing and are developing economically, that there's fairness so that everybody can have access to water, including this gender inequality problem. <laughs> you know, help fight for those things. Don't feel guilty about the water that you're using. Use it. It's kind of like when I was in, in uh, Scouts. I always hated it when they would do like, there's always the scoutmaster. It was the one scoutmaster who would always come around, usually an assistant scoutmaster, and the kids would be making a big old fire, and he'd come up and he'd say, you know, some stupid, semi-racist almost sounding thing, like, white man, make big fire, stand far back. <laughs> Indian, make small fire and stand close. And I'm like, you know what? Seriously, first of all, you're not, you're not Indians. So you shouldn't be saying that. Secondly, we got a big pile of wood here. we got to burn. Let us burn the wood. Um, there's some sort of like virtue signaling and a statement like that. And I, I don't want you to feel bad about using water, but you do use a lot of water. Cotton takes 2000 gallons just to make a pound of cotton. That's about how much your pants weigh. So 2000 gallons of water to make your pair of jeans. That, that does include all the processing too. A loaf of bread is 150 gallons of water. It takes 100,000 gallons of water to make a car. So we need water. What happens if you don't have that water? Well, we have water stress. And I talked about water scarcity. What about water stress? Water stress means that there's water scarcity and there's potential political problems going along with it. Water scarcity, less than 1,000 meters cubed per person per year is available. Water stress, 1,700, you're going to have political challenges. And uh, some of those political challenges are exemplified in, in Russia. In Lake Errol, in the former um, USSR, the Soviet Union, there used to be this big, lush, beautiful lake. And uh, the, the people started draining and diverting the rivers that flowed into that lake. And at the end of the day, you now have an empty lake. That's what it looked like in 1989 on the left, 2003 on the right, where it's basically a little mud puddle. And the cool thing is there are all these ghost ships out there. So if you ever want to do an interesting field trip, I guess you can go to Russia and go look at the ghost ships in Lake Errol. Well, all of this comes hey, down Dr. to- Dr. Uh, yeah. Dr. Ames, this is uh, just real quick to, sorry to interrupt. Um, everybody, everybody, I want to take a roll today. So if you could please raise your virtual blue hand, Holy we'll cow. take a roll. Wow. Okay, thanks. Hands are going up like crazy. That's a good way to do it. All right, so water, water, water is a question of scale. Water is a question of scale. Here we have something called an hydraulic jump. This is a small channel looking a very close little small river where we have water coming from the right to the left. It's moving downstream fairly fast. 
But as the water begins to slow down, you get the water downstream of it that is usually a little bit deeper. And so hydraulics, in your hydraulics class, you learn how to compute the various characteristics of water. How fast does water have to be to be flowing um, in this condition or in this condition? And where is the hydraulic jump going to live? And what are the conditions of it? So there's some kind of like cool local hydraulics that you can analyze. And then you can do things like Dr. Hotchkiss does, where he tries to figure out what the chance of people dying in, um, in little dams is and stuff like that. If you want to back out to a little bit bigger scale, you can and, and be more on the computer side of things. And there's always one or two of you in this class who are really into computers, who took some computer programming classes or wanted to do computer program in junior high or high school. You built web pages and you learned how to do a little Python or basic or something, or you're taking 170 and you're loving it. Um, you might be interested in the field of water engineering called hydroinformatics. And that's the combination of water and information systems technology, smash it together. So er, probably every year or two, somebody comes up and says, hey, can I join your hydroinformatics lab? I was about to quit civil engineering and go into computer science. But I didn't know we could do computer science stuff in civil engineering. Well, you can. And it all starts with collecting data, building little data collection networks like this one. This is my colleague, Jeff Horsburgh up at Utah State University. He bought a bunch, he got a grant from the National Science Foundation and bought a bunch of equipment and started putting it in to make um, sensors to sense water quality and quantity along this river. I think I did just see a hand go, or a, a hand go up. Can't see who it is though. So. Ian Hua, do you have a question? I think everyone's just got their hands up for a roll. Okay, yeah. still, we're just saying we're here. Yeah, yep, Vanessa is raising question, hand. They can, they Ian, we're here, we're here, don't forget me. So when Jeff started putting in all this equipment, he built little radio sensors in there and he could transmit the water quality and the water information from that sensor to a central tower. And then they start collecting it. And we start um, developing something called the data deluge. The term deluge is a water term, obviously, for a pun, an, a, a purposeful pun. A data deluge is what happens when you collect water measurements with a little sensor out in the river like this is measuring flow in cubic feet per second in a river channel and it looks like over one day he's measuring the flow 48 different times to see how fast how much water is flowing down the channel at the little bear river at mendon road near mendon utah in a week he gets 336 observations and he gets a lot more in a year 17,000 observations so the the field of hydroinformatics is how do you collect this data? And then what do you do with it? And how can you make sense of it? In three years, he's got 50,000 observations at that one station, but he has seven sites and he has 10 variables at each site that it, where he's collecting information. So he wants to know like, not just how fast and how much water's flowing, but what's the temperature of the water, how much dissolved oxygen is in the water. A lot of things that uh, he can sense from these probes that he's put in the river. So he's, um, he's got, depending on what data he's looking at, over 7 million observations in just a few years. And if you bring in the weather stations, you get up to 12 million observations. So suddenly you have more than you can just type into an Excel spreadsheet and make a cute little graph in Excel and look at and make sense of. So that's where we have to start building databases and using cloud computing and using machine learning and artificial neural networks to analyze the data, try to make sense of it and determine um, basically determine you know what's going on in the river and if there's a problem if we're going to be flooding if we're going to have water quality issues etc in in one way to uh one way that we here at byu have worked to address this problem has been to build a software system called hydroshare hydroshare.com hydroshare excuse me dot org hydroshare.org it's sort of like a youtube for water meaning that it's a place where people can stick information, just like you can stick a video up on YouTube, people can stick water data up on HydroShare. So instead of that singer, it's now this chart. And it's not just a chart, it's the raw data, and it's information about the data. And you could put up gigabytes of data, you could store it all here. And instead of having all kinds of YouTube videos, you can have access to all kinds of water data. And I've just got these charts in here just as a rough idea to show you a little bit of the concept behind HydroShare. But really, HydroShare 
is taking not just chart data like that, but also spatial data, like where are the river networks and, and stuff like this heat map and elevation maps and three-dimensional data and putting it all in a system. This is actually HydroShare, hydroshare.org. So this is one of the projects we've worked on here extensively at BYU for the last several years. It's a team, a team project. It's being led by Utah State University and we've got colleagues at the um, University of Virginia and Duke and um, North Carolina and uh, some places in Boston. Anyway, a bunch of different universities have gotten together with researchers to build this system to store and share data. And so this is a hydroinformatics problem. It's water combined with information science, information systems. Um, another cool thing we do in the Water Resources Group here at BYU is we try to host a study abroad program every year as a capstone senior project for people. So 2019, 21, 23, in odd numbered years, we're taking groups of students to the Dominican Republic. And then in even numbered years, we take groups of students to the Netherlands. And you may ask, you should be asking this right now actually, Dr. Ames, why the Dominican Republic and the Netherlands? What's so special about those two countries? The answer is um, nothing's particularly special. I mean, they're cool countries. Uh, Dr. Nelson served his mission in the Dominican Republic. And I have a bunch of colleagues and, and uh, people I work with and do research with in the Netherlands. But what's really cool about these two places is they create this interesting like yin and yang or a dichotomy of water where in the Dominican Republic, it's a developing country where water is very scarce. Water management and information and modeling and so forth is, is not very advanced. And so we send BYU students to the DR to teach them about better water management. In the Netherlands, the Netherlands is, has for a thousand plus years been the leaders in water resources management, building dams and dikes. And if without water management, about two thirds of their country is actually at or below sea level. So some of the best water engineering schools and best water engineering methods come out of the Netherlands. So we go to the Netherlands in even number of years to learn about water engineering. Either way, it makes for a fun study abroad. Here's the Netherlands, the place where a bridge is built so the river can cross the street. That is true. This is a place where the street goes underneath the river. Love it. Um, this is just a group of our study abroad group that went to the Netherlands a few years ago. And you can see they're very happy, cheerful people with matching jackets. And the sign says, I Amsterdam. And uh, have any of you been to the Netherlands? If so, please say so in the chat. Then on the, oh, and then they also, when we're studying water, we always dress like this. It makes people respect you more when you're walking around the streets, dressed in natural. Just kidding, this is actually obviously a little, studio where you can go get your picture taken. I believe, same group. And some of maybe the same group, might be a different group. I think this is a different group. Another year is standing on the North Sea and freezing cold weather at that time, but it was pretty fun. And uh, learning, we're actually standing on a dike here. This is a different group standing on a dike. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the North Sea. Well, if it's winter, this whole area will be flooded and there'll be storms lashing up against this ground on the left to protect that little house on the right. There's actually whole villages and stuff back there on the right. And these, these massive dikes extend all the way across the uh, and around parts of the Netherlands to protect water. Really interesting to see how they do that. And they've got some of the leading edge technology also. So using old style technology, just build a big pile of dirt to keep the water out and leading edge computer technology to analyze it and stuff. Here we are inside a massive dam or a ridge actually. And uh, also having some fun. I'm telling you all this because you can maybe start planning ahead and plan to go on a study abroad program for your capstone. And that's my daughter on the far right there, the cute little one. Uh, this is the largest movable dam in the world. Water resources engineers built this together with electrical engineers and structural engineers and geotechnical engineers. Took, took the whole group to make this. Each one of those arms, do you guys see that? Okay, this is, a, this is seriously a turn off uh, Facebook and Instagram moment because look, look over here at what I'm showing you. Each one of those arms, they move out into the river to block the river when the floods are coming up the river. 
and uh, it's to protect the city off in the distance. That's Rotterdam off in the distance up there. Um, back in the 1950s, uh, a large number of people in Rotterdam were killed. I think it was over 5,000 people due to floods that came through. And so they spent in the 90s and the early 2000s a couple of billion euros to build these dams like this all throughout this area. And this one, each one of those, if you took it and stood on edge, it's the height of the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Amazing, movable dams. Okay, here is a group of our study abroad students down in the Dominican Republic, together with some, uh, some of the DR colleagues and people down there. There's Dr. Nelson and his wife kind of in the middle right over here. And you can see they also have fun. They go exploring interesting places and go floating down rivers. And uh, actually that kid went to both of them. He was in my picture too. So somehow he finagled it to go on both programs. And they eat a lot of really good food in the DR, as you can imagine. And they see some beautiful uh, sites. And then they also, they see the temple. We see the temple in the Netherlands. And then when they're in the Dominican Republic, they also do some cool um, modeling and analysis for the local country there in the government agencies to show them where they could build dams or how they could better manage some of their water. Happy, cheerful civil engineers in the Dominican Republic. And that kid too, actually, that's Sarvapola. He went on both of them. So some people, they just get all excited about study abroad and pack in as much as they can. Looking, this is inside of a, there's a, a turbine inside a dam. And this is a posed picture, but these folks are looking at flow in this river right here. So that's just a really brief kind of quick and sudden overview of water resources engineering. I would love to take the last two or three minutes and answer any questions any of you may have. Yeah, so um, if, why don't we have everybody lower your virtual hands? And if you have questions, um, then you can raise your virtual hands. I see a couple of virtual hands raised. I don't know if these people have questions or they're just ignoring me. But um, Trevor, do you have a question? Trevor Hatch. Nope. Lydia, do you have a question? Lydia Coyle. Nope. How about Rebecca? Oh man. We're finding all the people who <laughs> Death Rose got aren't listening. Maybe maybe have people do the yes symbol for if they have a question rather ah, than raise good hand. Point. Okay, so if you have a question, do the yes symbol. I see one yes symbol. Where did it go? My problem with the yes symbol is it doesn't rise to the top. There it is. Okay, I see Jethro has a question. Yeah, I was wondering, like, how is there a significant difference between jobs and, um, and like, water engineering from the west compared to the east like are there more jobs out west oh wow that's a really good question you guys know why he's asking that because we live in this drought arid desert right jethro is that like, kind of where you're going yeah, with that? yeah yeah so we're in the arid west there's less water um i would say that the jobs are equally important and available in the west and the east one of the largest water agencies in the country is actually the saint john's um, water district in Florida and they've got a ton of water and they're managing Everglades and, and sort of managing the too much water side of things or enough water quality for the habitat and the environment versus out here in the west where we're managing the not enough water. When we go to the Netherlands we usually team up with a class over there of students and the students, uh, the Dutch students, the American students, we get together and do a team project. It's fun because the Dutch students are always a little bit mind blown when we talk to them about how we have to build a dam to store water so that we can have it to use for irrigation throughout the year. Because most of what they're doing is just trying to get rid of water and try to hold it back and stuff. Both sides of the problem, Jethro, have lots of, um, lots of jobs, yeah, water engineers. If anything, there may even be more back east, I think. Um, Easton also has a question. 
Yeah, I have a quick question for you. You're talking about how lots of professors here at BYU have active research projects that you can get involved in, right? To get paid yeah. while, you're, why, while you're studying. How can we um, find those active research projects? What's the best way to get, um, yeah, find out those opportunities? Great question, Easton. You should all be wondering the same thing. I think um, it's a matter of talking to the professors individually or emailing them. And so what you do is you get a, a professor that you are introduced to, like in a case like this, or your teacher that's teaching a class in civil engineering, or you look through the list of faculty in civil engineering on our homepage, and you see something that they're doing that's interesting, and you just email them cold and say, hey, I'm Easter Perkins, just wondering if you have any cool, interesting research going on in the area of blah, blah, blah. Um, I would, or if you're taking on any undergrad research assistance, because I would love more than life itself to come and work for you. And when we get emails like that, oftentimes we, we pick up students pretty quick. Um, so pretty much all the faculty hire some students and some hire more than others. And by the way, secret, 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 for those of you who are still paying attention and listening, secret insider information that freshmen don't always know. Your professors don't spend all their spare time just grading papers. Like really, that's what I used to think when I was a freshman, like they come teach my class and then they go grade their papers. But in engineering, we're not doing that. Maybe they do that in English and math, but what we're doing is we're teaching our class and then we're going off and doing these really cool research projects on the rest of our time. You should see some of the stuff that Dr. Frankie does. It's just like awesome, mind blowing, fun, interesting stuff with drones, data and visualizations and analysis, earthquakes and so forth. Your professors all have secret lives that they're leading and they have hired students to work with them to do that kind of work. And really, yes, secret lives. And so somebody says, Frankie is pretty epic. It's true, he really is. And so the, <laughs> to answer your question, Easton, it's really just about you putting in the energy to re read up on what they're doing, find out what they're doing and then go and talk to them and say, hey, Dr. Jones, I understand you're building water modeling uh, models to simulate the water flow in Africa right now on a cool project. I just saw it on your webpage. Um, can I come and talk to you about it sometime? Would you hire an undergraduate to process data for you this summer or this fall? And is, is it best, just to follow up on that question, is it best to wait until you're kind of a junior getting into those classes and get experience or? No, not at all. Our favorite, okay. Our, our best, I mean, in some cases, yeah, but for the most part, like if a good, energetic, enthusiastic, hardworking student um, comes up as a freshman and or sophomore and wants to work, they'll find a job, they'll find a, a team to work in. Now, they might be volunteer working part of their hours at the beginning, you know, there might be, or it might be, yeah, I've got five hours a week for you right now, but once you learn A, B, and C, boy, then next semester we can put you in at 10 or 15 hours a week and actually pay you or something. So. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay, great questions. Well, everybody, let's thank Dr. Ames for coming in and talking to us about water engineering today. Um, there are a couple more questions in the, in the um, comments. I'll just direct you to email your questions to Dr. Ames or any of the water faculty that um, he talked about today and they'll be happy to address your questions and i will look forward to seeing all of you next week thanks dr ames you bet adios take care everyone thanks thank you thank you so very much you're welcome definitely do email if you guys have any follow-up questions or anything